Welcome, my name is Michael Gaucher, and I'm here to talk about software development with Microsoft.net on low-end computers. And one may ask, how did I come about this question of how or whether or not you can develop software on a low-end computer? It just so happened years ago, between 2015 and 2017, 2018, I spent a lot of time on Quora. Quora, Quora is a website, Q-O-U-R-A, or is that Q-U-O-R-A, yes. So Quora is a website where you pose questions about physics, science, mathematics, technology, philosophy, religion, you name it. And people can weigh in on these these questions, the questions of existence, the questions of technology process, opinions about is Apple better than Microsoft or is this finally the year of the Linux desktop? And so I spent quite a bit of time on Quora answering questions, writing posts, that sort of thing. And I favored Quora over Stack Overflow for the types of social media interactions I was interested in. And one of the questions that arose one day was about uh, the best computer for writing software and whether or not a lower end computer would suffice. That wasn't the exact phrasing of the question, but I remember a question like that, uh, that had that vibe. And so various people weighed in. Uh, Quora is no stranger to uh, veterans of industry, people who have spent 30, 40, 50, and sometimes 60 years with software development and inf information technology in general. Uh, those people do exist. And so um, one of those individuals, I remember, gave an answer where they thought that a lower-end computer would be totally sufficient. My instinctive response, and I I think I, I weighed in on the question, but my instinctive response was that um, a low-end computer um, probably wasn't the right way to go, but that you can get there in terms of software development by in, you know, investing in something that's going to um, have at least a five-level processor or greater. And so both Intel and AMD make processors that they put into different levels. And so you got your third level processor, your fifth level processor, seventh level processor, ninth level processor, and then your more engineering data center oriented processor. And so AMD's data center engineering oriented processor is called Epic and Intel's is called Xeon. And so my instinctive response is that an Intel Core i7 or an AMD Ryzen 7 processor, preferably the H series, is going to be the way to start. But that question actually um, resonated with me a bit over the years in that I know that if you use the command line, you code in the command line, you compile in the command line, you access servers and services using the command line tools, that the resource requirements for those tools is far lower than what you're going to need if you're using more elaborate and feature rich visual tools. And so I set on to look at the question of low-end computers, not solely because of this question that I saw on Quora, but I do work with people who ask me all the time about the relative strengths of different computers, different brands of computers and that sort of thing. And I've been fielding questions like that for several years. And so I have computer science knowledge, education and background, and I have um, a very strong IT, software, hardware, networking background. And I know that conceptually, the hiring computers are the way to go. And I know that in the real world, in the typical experience, that the better the computer is made, the longer it's going to last, the better it's going to hold up, 
the, the better it's going to sustain what it does over a longer period of time. But that doesn't discount the use and the relevance of lowering computers. They have a place. And I also know that you can tune a computer to get it to where you want it to be either for a short period of time or you know if you're if you maintain it regularly you will be able to um, have that computer uh, operate effectively for you there are some limits to that but what i wanted to see was what are the limits because i think that's the best way to answer those questions to not automatically discount low-end computers and say they have no place at all but to understand that they exist and there is a way you can use them and so I am doing this study on an, a computer with an Intel Pentium processor with four gigabytes of RAM I did upgrade the hard drive uh, to a 500 gigabyte SSD manufactured by Samsung and this whole process is happening on an 11-inch 2-in-1 HP computer that has this Intel Pentium. This Intel Pentium is a quad-core, by the way. And so that does help with its performance. And the 4 gigabytes of RAM, that is quite a limitation, but it's not as substantial a limitation um, as it appears. And I'm going to do software development in this environment, and I'm going to do it by recreating a program that I have already written, coded, debugged, tested, wrote blog posts about, all of that. So this program that I wrote, I wrote it in the Linux environment and I used C++, I used SQLite, LibXML, or sometimes it's called XML2, whatever you might call it, GNOME XML. I used curl and I used, um, you know, open source, Linux oriented libraries, coding libraries, and I found them very effective for what I wanted to do. My main experience is with Microsoft technology using Microsoft.net, Microsoft tools, and that sort of thing. So recreating this program on a, in a Windows environment, uh, coming from a Linux environment, is, is, is as far away from far-fetched as could be concerning myself. And so, um, Linux is something that I do in my, my private time. I do that well away from my professional endeavors. Um, I have a variety of reasons for that. But for me personally, in my home setting and in my private uh, use of computers, Linux, open source, free software is absolutely fabulous. But many people use Windows and Windows desktops in particular on laptops or the tower form factor to accomplish their work. And so this whole study is relevant to uh, that group and to that audience who has questions about how low-end computers fit um, in, in the, um, the line of things when it comes to computers. Um, Windows does not know the ELF format. ELF, um, I believe that stands for extended Linux format for the software executables, for the program executables. So your program file, uh, all your program files have formats. And on Windows, it's called PE, Portable Executable Format. Um, it has various names, Portable Executable 32, uh, so on and so forth. But whenever you make a program, you take that source code and you compile it, it's going to compile into a format, a binary format that the system understands. Now, some programs are interpreted, um, but even if they're interpreted, they're interacting with a system that is going to use the format du jour for that operating system. And so, and then in your Unix environment, your, your Darwin format is, um, you know, your, your format. And of course, Linux can understand a variety of formats. Um, I believe with some bootstrapping, you can get Linux to understand the portable executable format. I'm not actually talking about Windows for Linux, right? There's a subsystem for Linux for Windows called Windows for Linux, or I believe it's called um, WSL, but that allows you to run Linux programs on Windows. But in terms of actually running a 
GUI executable directly at this stage in time, as far as I know, that's not going to run natively on Windows without some additional modifications to WSL. And so the most efficient, most effective way to get a Windows program based on one that you've written in Linux is to use the Microsoft tools for creating those programs in a Windows environment. And so uh, this process of creating a software program is going to entail a couple of uh, high level steps. One, you got to know the requirements and we're going to do requirements um, in a um, very efficient and condensed fashion by way of a screenshot. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a screenshot of the software program, I'm gonna run it in Linux, and I'm gonna take a screenshot of that, and we're just gonna recreate what we see. We don't actually need to know the C++ code. We don't have to know how SQLL Lite uh, works. We don't have to know how curl works. We don't have to know how GDB works. We don't have to know any of those things. We don't have to know how Linux works. We just need to know what does this program looks like? What does it look like? It got buttons on it and all this kind of stuff. And so we're just going to recreate that. And then we're going to make the transition from Linux to Windows easier by migrating the database that sits behind this, this computer program. And this database is an SQL-like database. It's an SQL-like format. And we're going to migrate that to SQL Server. So we're going to migrate from SQLite to SQL Server, and we're going to migrate from C++ to C Sharp. And whereas we're going to run SQL queries on SQLite, we're not going to touch or even look at the C++ at all. We're just going to say, okay, here's my screenshot, and what C Sharp code can I write that will um, make that screenshot become a reality in the form of a computer program? We begin this journey on Linux. In particular, Fedora 36 with the Cinnamon desktop. I just finished compiling a program I wrote in C++. It had been two years since I last compiled the code into a program and there were two errors presented by the compiler. A function provided by WebKit that I used had changed. I had used this function plenty of times with no issue, and after reviewing the error, I updated the code to the new reality. The second error came from the GNU C++ compiler. This compiler accepted all of my code just fine two years ago. After pulling in the code from GitHub a couple of days ago, I attempted to compile the program and the compiler found an issue with one line of code that it was previously okay with. I updated the code to pass the compiler check. I am very fortunate that this one line of code out of the hundreds of lines of code I wrote two years ago was the only one that had an issue. The program now runs better than it did two years ago. Improvements in the newest C++ compiler, the GNU C++ compiler, are quite noticeable. I am very pleased that the software code I wrote two years ago still holds true. I am making a copy of the SQL Lite 3 database used by the program. The database file contains all the data downloaded by this program. I now have two copies of this database. A copy from two years ago and one from a couple of days ago when I last ran the program. I am going to put both database files on a flash drive and put them on a Windows laptop. What I want to see is how easily I can recreate this program on Microsoft Windows using Microsoft programming and database management tools. This will be done on an 11 inch laptop with an Intel Pentium CPU and 4 gigabytes of RAM. I want to see how far I can go 
on what is considered a low-end computer. I don't have a fetish for this sort of thing. I just want to be able to experientially answer the question, what are the limitations of a low-end computer? Using my experience, building software is one way to answer that question. To accomplish this, I only need the database, these SQL-like database files, and a solid description of the program. I don't even have to examine the C++ code I wrote on Linux. The way I go about this on Microsoft Windows will be completely different. I am running the program now. I call it Gaucher RSS Reader. It was written in C++ and directly binds to the GTK C API to produce a visual layout and other functionality. It also uses an SQL-like database to hold the data it downloads from websites. And these websites publish their information in RSS format. Typically, RSS formatted as XML, the program uses GNU XML and curl to process data in this format. I made screenshots of the program when we were in Linux, and um, I'm going to use that, pro that screenshot to build the Windows version based on appearance alone and not through the code um, as it is written in Linux. So Git, G-I-T, is a system that Linus Torvalds, who also created Linux, uh, created to manage the versions of software, to create snapshots of sof software, and you can use it to uh, have a copy of the software backed up to a repository. So I'm going to install Git on Windows, and I'm going to try a newer method to doing so. Previously, you could go to the uh, Git website, git.org, I believe is the web address, and download an, a setup file to install Git, Git for Windows. This method that I'm using is uh, using called, it's called WinGit, not to be confused with Git. I know this is spelled W-I-N-G-E-T. This is a package manager that um, is a is Microsoft's uh, copy, carbon copy of uh, Linux package managers. It may have taken them 30 years to get here. I'm just glad it's here. It's very convenient to use. And as you just saw, I installed Git for Windows using the command line in Windows, similar to how I would do it using Linux. So the 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 gap between Linux and and Microsoft Windows is narrowing in terms of the concepts. And so let's run the git command. This is a program that is um, in Git. I'm sorry, that is in Windows uh, that allows us to run um, the the git commands in a command line. You can't run those git commands in the normal Windows command prompt without additional changes. So we got the command line uh, version of git, which is very useful. And I'm now going to download GitHub for Windows. GitHub is the actual repository that I'm using. And by using the desktop version, it provides a visual alternative to using Git on the command line. And so installing GitHub desktop is pretty easy. There is very little that's complicated about it. And when you install it and when you log in, it may present a number of pop-up uh, prompts that can be a little confusing at first, but um, after a little while, it's pretty straightforward what you need to do to resolve any login errors. These are all of my repositories. They're listed on the right-hand side. And what I want to do is create a Git repository for this new project that I'm going to create here. So I want a repository that focuses only on the WP, the Microsoft Windows version of this program written in C Sharp and that uses the WPF uh, framework. And so 
I'm going to give this repository an appropriate name. Um, I'm going to call it Gaucher uh, RSS Reader Windows or Gaucher RSS Reader uh, WPF. Um, actually, I think uh, calling it uh, MSWPF for Microsoft WPF would be more appropriate. And so I went with that name, Gaucher underscore RSS underscore reader underscore MS underscore WPF to denote that this is a RSS reader by Gaucher and it's um, designated, it's a version for the Microsoft Windows uh, platform and it uses WPF. Um, in my description, um, I am more explicit. I put in the description RSS Reader for Microsoft Windows. I click the button to create repository, and that initiates a number of actions um, creating the repository um, locally on the computer. That's why that click goes pretty quickly. But when I click the button to publish the repository, and I got two ways to do that. I got that button up there, and I got the button on the right-hand side. Um, then this takes just a little bit longer because we have to go over the internet to um, upload this blank repository. I know it's a blank repository, but there are actual files that are associated uh, with every Git repository, even when it's a blank repository. And so that has been accomplished. And again, all of this is occurring on an Intel Pentium CPU with four gigabytes of RAM. Um, not bad. So let's launch Visual Studio. Uh, the objective here is to create a, a Visual Studio solution, a Visual Studio project that's going to um, hold the user interface. And Visual Studio 2022 makes that easy. You can do it a number of ways. You can go straight to creating a project, which is what I want to attempt to do at first. Um, my best practice is not to um, jump right in and create a project um, through uh, Visual Studio uh, when no project exists yet. What I'd rather do is create a Visual Studio solution, so a solution file. So I'm going to continue without code. I'm going to click that option, and then let's create a new pr new um, project. Let's try it this way uh, this time. It's the same old uh, screen, right? Um, but this time, let's choose other for the uh, project types, and then there it is, blank solution. So solution file is basically a configuration file in Visual Studio that um, keeps track of all the projects organized under that solution and so um, as I mentioned earlier I'm going to create a a data conversion project right we're going to convert the SQL light database to a SQL server database and we're also going to create a WPF UI uh, right uh, project and so the a solution file allows both of these projects to coexist in the same Visual Studio instance. And so um, here I want to call the solution gaucher.rss or dot uh, app dot reader dot UI perhaps. So um, reader. So let's just go with it that way. And this establishes the the um, high level namespace the top level namespace so what you call your top level namespace is very important you don't want to go overboard with that because you can end up with problems where your file names are too long but now that we have the solution file created it's now time to um, add projects to the visual studio solution actually we're going to just add a single project and um, I choose the desktop category because that's what we're creating here. We're creating a desktop user interface program. And we're going to use C Sharp as a language, so that's my filters. I tell you, we, we've come a long way, but these filters have existed um, for quite some time. But I like this 
presentation of the filters in this version of Visual Studio. So I chose WPFapp.NET Framework and I'm going to give the project name an appropriate name. Um, it's going to align with the solution name I stated earlier. Notice that the solution name, the prefix of, matches the solution name and then I add .ui. So this project is going to um, be called negotiate.app.rss.reader.ui. That's the namespace under which the code for this particular user interface project is uh, going to be defined under. And then in the other projects would have that same gaucher.app.rss.reader prefix as the top level namespace reference. So this is the project template um, that Visual Studio has for creating a WPF program window. So we essentially have a window. If I were to press the start button you see up there in the middle of the screen, top middle of the screen, it looks like a, the play button on a VCR. But if you press start, then you're going to um, see a application ready to go out of, out of the box, so to speak. I want to set up my, my Git configuration to ignore certain directories and files because I don't need to track everything in Git. These files are local files and they are working files. They're not final files, right? And so they're temporary, they're intermediate. And so they, they denote the transition from your source code to your final executable. And we don't want um, any of anything that is temporary or that um, is um, uh, generated on the fly merely to support the project. Um, we don't want to incorporate that into the Git repository. We want only the um, the primary reference um, items in the project. And so that's what I did with Git Ignore. What I did want to do was right click in, in, um, in the uh, changes window and ignore um, obj forward slash debug and then obj forward slash release so I opened the git ignore file explicitly and added an obj forward slash reference which will capture all um, obj files. So I'm continuing to um, ignore files and now I'm ready to commit what I have um, set up to the git repository so I'm going to do it in one step through the visual menus there commit everything and then um, and stage it and push it up to the Git repository. Now that the changes have been pushed to github.com, I should see a reflection of those changes at github.com forward slash Michael Gaucher. So far, so good.